There's a lot of talk and writings about loving yourself, but as you see more and more writing about it by different secular people or people from different religions, the more you see people becoming more depressed. As they love themselves more, they're becoming more depressed as a result of it because usually the way people solve this loving yourself crisis by, is by enabling you to fulfill your desires. Love yourself by getting a new spouse. Love yourself by buying yourself something new. Love yourself by fulfilling some form of desire. The truth is that loving yourself has nothing to do with fulfilling desires. Rather, loving yourself begins with knowing what it even means to love yourself. The Chazonish's Jewish Ashkafa series is something that has transformed our minds over the last few years in ways we never thought even possible. And tonight, it's going to do the unthinkable. It's going to give us a brand new clarification and definition of what loving yourself really means. And in fact, what achieving true freedom actually entails. Once you hear this shiul, you're never going to think the same or even see the world the same way. And in fact, you're going to be that much closer to loving yourself once and for all in a way that's going to make you happy. Enjoy the shiur, share it, and be holy. Hashem Hashem Naaseh V'Natzliach, Shiur Torah, Buchim Abayim. We're back here starting a new week, Baruch Hashem. And continuing our uh, long-standing series, our uh, Jewish Hashkafa series has been going on. I've just been uh, notified for over three years, Baruch Hashem. Uh, the uh, Jewish Hashkafa series has certainly uh, transformed our minds uh, you know, in, in, in very extraordinary ways, simply letting us know how to think like Jews. And uh, Baruch Hashem, tonight is another one of those lectures that's going to simply uh, reteach us things that we should have known all along, but quite frankly, uh, no one's really been talking about it, uh, at least not to my knowledge. Um, tonight's show is going to be for the Refua uh, Shlema for Rav Ephraim ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sarah bat Anat, uh, Rabbanit uh, Lavana bat Sarah. Avimori David Ben Esria, Imimorati Doris Bat Jora, Sarah Bat Esther, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahides that continue to uh, watch our lectures, share them, support them, and uh, do everything possible to get us uh, to reach more and more people uh, around the world. As a reminder for everybody, we still have uh, more books available in the Kiruv store and more of these uh, cards. Uh, these uh, movie cards, Baruch Hashem, have gotten great feedback, so anyone that wants to get 10 or more of these and uh, spread them in their community, uh, please uh, go to kiruvstore.org, kiruvstore.org, K-I-R-U-V, store.org, and also please get copies of these books to give it out to Hebrew speakers uh, in your communities as well. If your community is a non-Jewish community, uh, and uh, there's really no reason for you to get these books because this is in Hebrew and it's meant for Jews. I know that there's uh, some people out there that are simply just trying to give stuff out to people, but this is not a collectible. This is a book to read that's going to help you serve a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, all of you that are, have been watching me for a long time, I expect each and every single one of you to get yourself at least one or two boxes of these uh, books and uh uh, and cards to give it on your communities, whether people like me or not, once they open the book, they actually understand why you've been listening for the last several years. Bo Hashem. Uh, aside from that, as an update to anyone that uh, hasn't heard, but we uh, launched our uh, new podcast last night uh, of the uh, Returning to Hashem, the Chuva stories of different students from around the world. Uh, and last night's uh, uh, first video, first podcast, uh, got, Baruch Hashem, amazing uh, feedback from the people that have watched it. But it certainly needs a, uh, you know, quite a few more people to watch it because it's just an amazing story of an amazing person uh, that uh, needs to be heard. So if you go to our channel, you'll see it. It's a, uh, you know, it's a one hour video, a little less than an hour video of a personal story of somebody doing tshuva and uh, literally... Uh, some of my other students that have been already in on the tshuva train for several years uh, have, uh, you know, replied and said, listen, I thought I did tshuva until I saw him, until I saw Moshe. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a wonderful story. It'll certainly make you cry. 
Uh, but it's it's just one of those uh, things that uh, needs to be heard. So, Baruch Hashem, we've gotten good feedback out of it, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, next week, what you guys think of the next story. Bezat Hashem, we'll have a new episode each Motzei Shabbat uh, at around the 9 p.m. time frame. The moment I knew that Rabbi Yaron was my rabbi, when I was in yeshiva, I fell in love. I already met my future wife, you know, and I was like, I don't know what I should do. Like, I was kind of battling with like this thing inside. I was like, they're telling me like I should stay, grow, you know, at the yeshiva. But Rabbi Yaron just reaches out to me out of the blue and he says, by the way, if they're asking you to stay and you're trying to decide if you should stay or go back to continue dating this girl, you go back and continue this girl. You're not going to get another shit up like this. And I was like, how did he just know what I was just dealing with? And I said, okay, that's it. You know, battling. Should I? Should I? I nudge and I said this is my rock that's it like this is for me this is Hashem sending him like this is who I got to listen to uh, so with that being said uh, let's go on into our uh, series we have uh, section 14 of this chapter which we're going to try to complete tonight it's a uh, uh, an enormous amount of material but uh, quite frankly it's all connected to each other, so we really can't break it up uh, like we have in the past. You know, in the uh, last year, uh, the Chazoni started this section where uh, he uh, let us know that the cure for bad character traits is not by uh, way of material medication because the disease is not one of the body and therefore the cure is not of material substance. In so many words, he's letting us know exactly what the Rambam uh, wrote about 800 years ago, which is that bad midot, bad character traits, are not uh, just something that you could just uh, disregard. They're a spiritual disease. And because they're a spiritual disease, they cannot be cured by material possessions. So if you think that your anger is due to your financial strains, uh, if you think that your impatience is because of uh, 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 your lack of good health, uh, if you think that your stinginess is uh, because of the uh, you know the rough times that you're having with your family. Uh, unfortunately, you're wrong. Uh, although those things don't help, uh, and they certainly are triggers. But if somebody has bad character traits, whether it be anger or stinginess or arrogance or whatever the case may be, every one of us has uh, has uh, one or two or fifty that we have to fix. Uh, these are spiritual diseases. What does it mean, spiritual diseases? Because most people don't realize the significance of what uh, spiritual disease means. And Rabbi Ephraim clarifies it uh, by simply saying, just like psychosis is a disease, you know, being a psychotic, being a, a, a person that is obviously uh, clearly ill according to all standards, so is a you know arrogance. So is stinginess. So is a uh, you know a, a person that's constantly angry. That's a disease. It's no different than the other. The only difference between the two is one is uh, has more to do with the physical, while the other has to do with the uh, spiritual. But nonetheless, they should be treated uh, with the same level of seriousness, because if a person disregards. Their, uh, their disease, they're not just putting themselves at risk, but they're putting others at risk. There was a horrific story that came out a few years ago in Eretz Yisrael, where a uh, really a, a, a series or, or a chain of bad character traits led to a murder. And how so? There was a shatchan, uh, you know, that uh, wanted to make money. You know, a guy that makes, a, uh, makes matches in the Jewish community, and there was a family that wanted to make sure that their son gets married. Everyone is from, everyone is religious, so they're not going to find a, uh, a bride for this guy in a bar. They obviously have to make a match. Now, what they didn't tell uh, the, uh, the people that were uh, you know, considered uh, is that their son had a mental disease, was a, uh, had a mental disease that uh, he had to take treatment for, he had to take pills. And of course, one lie led to another. The family lied, the Shatran lied, and the, uh, the family whose daughter 
uh, married this guy also did not know what was going on so of course there were you know when they met the guy when when the girl met the guy everything sounded great and uh, they ended up getting married and shortly thereafter she got pregnant and uh, they had a baby now up to now this sounds like a wonderful story until the baby turns approximately one years old uh, maybe even younger than that and uh, the father decided on his own that he's just doesn't think he needs the pills anymore he doesn't think he needs the psychosis pills anymore he felt that it's over he feels good he's married he's got a kid everything is going fine why should he continue taking these pills that only psychotic people take so he decided to stop taking them and of course as soon as he stopped taking them the psychosis returned with a vengeance and he ended up murdering his child murdering his child his baby child and of course once the uh, the murder was discovered and the arrest uh, 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 followed uh, what was discovered was this series of lies from the Shatran, from the family from everybody that even the wife did not know that her husband is taking these pills obviously if she did uh, not only would she have made sure that he takes the pills but she probably wouldn't have married him in the first place but this type of heartache this type of trauma is not something you could just put a band-aid on this is not something that you could just simply forget this is a traumatizing experience that's not going to go anywhere and all starts with bad midot it starts with bad character traits where people simply feel that their needs are superior to others so if that means that they have to lie a little bit cheat a little bit that's not really a problem why because you know listen we'll do good in order to uh cover up the bad this also happens in business many times where, you know, unlike the jewelry business where they, uh, the way that they do business in the jewelry business to this day is simply on handshakes. In so many words, once somebody wants to sell a watch or a diamond or whatever it is, it could literally be a deal worth millions of dollars. There's no contracts. There's no, uh, it's just simply a handshake mazal. And that's what they say. I wish all business was that way. Uh, but the truth is that it's not and the reason why is because in a diamond business in a jewelry business they're taking a risk uh, that's uh, simply believing the other guy's word now if the guy lies one time not only uh, will they uh, uh, will this guy not uh, do business with him anymore but no one will do business with him anymore because the word spreads out that this guy is a liar now of course many liars are there many liars are everywhere so these things happen anyway but uh, the point being is is that in the business world in general most people have these huge contracts very long contracts which full of you know legal jargon that no one really understands aside from the lawyers and uh, in order to protect themselves from liars from cheaters from people that are in so many words trying to fool them and uh, one of the things that people don't understand is that the reason why people lie is very much the same reason of why people do all other bad things it all stems from bad character traits hence the reason why the rambam and thereafter of course many other chachamim along with the chazonish call bad character traits a spiritual disease meaning that it's not going to be cured just simply by going away or by uh, uh by time now once we understand that bad character traits are something that we have to cure cure with spiritual uh, uh foods spiritual medicine we have to understand what this medicine is now in the uh in the secular world and even in the so-called religious world uh, of different religions well including of course lahavdil judaism Many people have uh, become more uh, accustomed to trying to get people to love themselves. Apparently, everyone feels like there's a lack of loving ourselves. People don't love themselves anymore. That's why they do this, and that's why they do that. That's why they're depressed, and that's why they're suicidal. And quite frankly, uh, once you hear what the Chazonish has to say, you'll realize that all of this is nonsense. Everything you've probably heard about loving yourself literally turns into nonsense not because we're trying to insult them but simply because it's so far removed from what the truth is 
Because generally speaking, if you look at the so-called teachers, consultants, psycho uh, uh, psychologists, and all types of other uh, self-help gurus, they're telling you to love yourself. How do you love yourself? Simply fulfill your desires. Love yourself by buying yourself something nice. Love yourself by meeting somebody nice. Love yourself by eating something delicious. In so many words, their solution to a, a person that's not loving themselves is by fulfilling a desire. But the truth is that loving yourself has nothing to do with fulfilling desires. In fact, fulfilling your desires is sometimes the reason why you don't love yourself. So that's why you see many people show up to these different seminars read these different books about self-love but yet after completing the seminar emptying their bank account buying the books wasting their time they're exactly in the same place they left but only now they think that if they just simply eat more or eat better or exercise more or or, or make more money or meet more people then perhaps that's the solution only to find out that you know it's not and usually the author and the uh, gurus are hoping that by then they forgot that they actually uh, had this idea all along the chazonish is about to tell us what is really behind self-love but first and foremost we have to continue in understanding what you know uh, we started off last week and he says as follows indeed the worst disease that exists out of this you know the, the the spiritual disease of bad character traits the worst disease of all is what we've already discussed in previous lectures in this series which is the one of baseness meaning low life a person that's simply a low life that is the worst possible one a person has such bad character traits it's not an insult anymore to call him a low life he himself will sometimes even admit he's a low life in fact sometimes they're even proud of it you know and they think that being a god a bad guy is a good guy is a good thing and again this type of lowliness is a disease but unlike any other why is it unlike any other says the chazonish this lowliness of the spirit cannot be cured by reading trees of musar and it's necessary to cure the soul at its root and to lift it up from the depth of the tita yavin here the chazonish is giving us some pretty shocking words because he's telling us that this low life status that a person can have where they have simply decided that they're going to be this angry monster this stingy person this this uh you know insensitive person this arrogant mule and that's just the way they're going to be and in fact everyone just simply has to deal with it everyone has to accept it love it welcome it this person cannot be cured by musar now we've given Baruch Hashem hundreds and hundreds of lectures about Musar, the different aspects of Musar, whether it's the series of Pirkei Avot that goes into the roots of Musar from the sages to the lectures of the Ramban, the, Ram, uh, the, the Gaon Mi Vilna, uh, the, of course, this series and many other things that we've discussed each and every single week for the last almost decade. And never have we said that someone cannot be cured by Musar until today because generally speaking musar is the cure but here the chazonish is telling us for this person this low life musar will not work it simply will not work why because the disease has to be cured from the root the root of this person that has decided that this is the way he is and this is the way he will be and everyone has to accept it and welcome it even is so rotten that simple musar is just not going to help him its cure lies in acquiring wisdom because every person has an immense storehouse empty and available for wisdom and knowledge and every living soul thirsts to fill it now 
to understand what's being said here is that when a person is a low life this is in essence a not just a bad trait this is a bad status and the difference is is that as the admomi kotsk once said he used to sign all of his letters uh you know uh after at the end of the letter the uh, he would write uh, uh menachem mendel mikotsk the uh the shval a shafail i met the uh the uh, menachem mendel of kotsk the uh uh the real uh, the lo- uh, the real low one in so many words a expression of humility now of course there was a faker that uh tr- you know did the same thing and he wrote his name and at the end of his letters and uh, he would write the uh shafel uh, the shamed mehmet the uh, the low one now that moment because was a fire of emit and as soon as he found out that one of the people in his community was doing it and he uh, encountered him he told me there is a difference there is a difference between what i write and what i what you write he says i am the low one really you are just low you're just a low life because you're just simply copying you're not actually working on yourself you're not uh, uh humbling yourself you're just pretending so today if somebody said that to other people they would literally put the rabbi on cherem because no one could accept such truth but the reality is that many times people think that if they change their clothing or they change their exterior then that in essence will make them righteous that will make them happy that will make them successful but there's nothing further from the truth now when a person is uh, in a status of lowliness Musar is not going to help them because Musar is, as Rabbi Ephraim explains, Musar is like rain. Rain can either help something grow or it can help destroy something. One or the other. Hashem used it to bring sustenance to Am Yisrael or He helped the world see disaster, whether it's the Mabul, the flood of Noah, or it's uh, any of the number of curses that happened to us during the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash and other times when Am Yisrael was not following the will of God and we had punished and the curses of Parashat Bechukotai, uh, Zinu, uh, Parashat Nitzavim, these are three different places where HaKadosh Baruch Hu outright curses uh, the, uh, uh, us if we don't follow His Torah. And part of that curse is to not get rain. Now, Musar is just like rain and therefore lowliness cannot be healed by simple musar because if you rain musar you bring musar to someone at lowliness all it's going to do is grow what's already there that rain will grow what's already there so if a person is an arrogant person them learning musar will actually make them even more arrogant if a person is an angry person them learning Musar will just give them different ways to express their anger. So if he was an arrogant person, then he's just going to express his arrogance in a different way by pretending to be humble. And some of the Chachamim say that the worst form of arrogance is someone pretending to be humble. If he's an angry person, Musar will simply make him angry in different ways and in so many words, self-righteous about his anger by expressing his anger by simply insulting everyone and anyone that he can that is not righteous enough. Oh, you violate this, you do this, ah, and he's just simply, wherever he goes, it's like literally like a, uh, a house of bees just bust open and everyone's running away. Why? Because this guy just came in and just simply criticizing everyone. He's criticizing the rabbi, he's criticizing the keila, he's criticizing the gabai, he's criticizing every single thing that's out there. No one is ever good enough for him. So Musar is not helping that guy. Unfortunately, sometimes you see them and you see how these people, they could be learning Musar for five, six, ten years. And after... They, uh, they decided they've reached a peak. Who do they start criticizing? They start criticizing the source. Some of the best emails that I ever get is when people that have been watching my lectures show that they really haven't learned anything, even though they've watched it for four or five, six, seven years. This Bochashev doesn't happen often, but it happens. 
It happens often enough because Hashem, there's a lot of people. So you get them often enough to always remember those people and always remember those emails. Where it's all, listen, Rabbi, I don't think you will write about doing such and such. I think you need to do tshuva. Okay. Rabbi, I don't think that uh, what you said over there is, uh, doesn't make any sense. I think you need to make a new video uh, and, and, and apologize to people for making a mistake. Did, did you have a proof that I made a mistake? No, it just doesn't make it just doesn't make sense. Oh, so you assume that because it doesn't make sense to you, or because you don't know it, or because you, you didn't see it, therefore I must be wrong, not you. I got you. And many times you'll see these things, and you realize that wow, this guy has been a girl has been watching the lectures for years. And hasn't learned a single thing. In fact, it made them worse. It was better off they didn't watch anything. This is like somebody that does tshuva without a rabbi. Some of the greatest rabbis in the last generation have said, people that do tshuva without a rabbi, it's better they don't do tshuva. Why? They'll become worse. So, Rabbi Ephraim says that when this rain, the spiritual rain, also known as Musar, falls on a low life, it doesn't heal anything, but in fact, it grows the horrible things that he or she already has. It's like cleaning someone while he's inside a swamp, says Rabbi Ephraim. So you turn them, you're cleaning, 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 and then you turn them again, and everything you just, to, to clean the next side, and everything you just clean goes back in a swamp. And you clean and clean and clean, and you turn them again, and then everything you just cleaned goes back in the swamp. It's never going to be cleaned. All you're doing is just wasting your time. All you're doing is just pretending like some type of uh, 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 production is happening over there, but nothing is really happening. Why? He's staying dirty because he's still within the same filth. He hasn't gotten out of the filth. He hasn't gotten out of his own way. Because the only way that a person can get out of this low life status is as the Chazoni says is through wisdom and knowledge through Torah that the person needs to learn Musar is simply not going to be enough for that person now the Chazonish uses interesting words that are not always translated uh precisely in the English translation, where he says that a person that is in this particular situation has to cure himself from the root to pull himself out of tit ayavin. What's tit ayavin? For any of you that have watched my film, Genom, you know that the Genom has seven names that are mentioned in the Torah. One of those names is Tita Yavin. In so many words, the Chazoni says that the person that's a low life, he's living Gehenom. His life is Gehenom. It's a miserable life. He may look happy. He may look proud. He may look satisfied, but he's literally the most miserable person on planet Earth. This is the reason why anyone that has looked at the statistics I've mentioned in the past, the suicide rate in America, over 70% of the people that commit suicide are wealthy people. Suicide is not a poor person's problem. People that have all of their desires fulfilled, whether it's their, their uh, lust, their, their hunger, their whatever desires they have, they're the ones that actually end up committing suicide more often than anyone else. Now, logically, this doesn't make any sense. But when we learn what the Chazonish is telling us here, it's starting to wait. Hold on a second. So wait, you're telling me that success, wealth, beauty, fulfilling all the desires, that makes you miserable? Not necessarily. But it's not far away from that. And we'll understand in a moment. If a person is trying to cure his spiritual ailment through all types of material and physical uh, 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 things, 
that person is simply going to make matters worse. If she thinks that she's going to cure her loneliness by being promiscuous, then she doesn't realize that she will become more lonely as a result of it. If he thinks that he's going to cure his fear of poverty by stealing money, he doesn't realize that his fear will only get bigger, aside from the fact that his life will be on the line because he'll go to jail eventually for it. The point being is, is that many times people think that if they satiate their physical needs, they'll become happy. But there's nothing further from the truth. As the Chazuni says that the cure for this low life state, the worst of diseases, is in acquiring wisdom. Because naturally, a Kadosh Baruch who created every person with immense storehouses that are empty and available for wisdom and knowledge, and every living soul thirsts for them. In you, you have storehouses. Just imagine you have containers or you have uh, uh, warehouses completely empty waiting for merchandise to come in but it's not going to accept everything and anything at all times it wants merchandise it has customers but if you feed it the wrong things it may make some bad choices and simply force itself to accept it until everything goes out of business although bodily desires do turn a person to other aspirations that destroy the desire for wisdom completely, turning one's ear to learning Torah and knowledge is a sure way of defeating the material cravings and foreign attractions. Here the Chazonish is telling us part of the cure of having this, this, say, this horrible status is learning Torah, listening to Torah, Listening to Shure Torah like this one is part of the cure because one of the things that gets in the way of you curing yourself is that you're constantly encountering different tests. You turn on a screen, you see a bunch of commercials for food. You see a bunch of commercials for all types of immorality, all types of pritzut. You pick up a phone, Call somebody or somebody calls you and immediately they start talking about somebody in somebody's life. Things that are forbidden for you to hear, forbidden for you to repeat, forbidden for you to even be a part of. You go to the store, there's endless opportunities, endless opportunities to buy things that you shouldn't. Endless opportunities to take things that don't belong to you. You go to work, Endless opportunities to do the wrong thing, to steal, to be dishonest, to lie. There are constantly different things that we encounter every single day that the Satan puts right in front of us, up close and personal, in your face, another billboard, another commercial, another conversation, another flirt, another something that's constantly getting in the way of you thinking straight of how do I fix myself? How do I get a hold of myself and actually start approaching the battle of happiness the right way rather than trying to satiate myself with another donut or another uh, uh, electronic item or another thing that I'm going to buy on Amazon? How do I satiate my hole that's inside me of misery without actually buying something, without actually fulfilling some type of physical need? And when a person listens, takes his time, and instead of buying more stuff, instead of talking about more stuff, instead of doing anything else, they simply press play on another Be'ezat Hashem video, and they listen to another Torah lecture. That in itself is part of the cure. Why? Because that is going to not only take up your time away from the Amazons, away from the phone calls, 
away from the stores, away from the Shonara, away from cheating customers, away from doing all of those things. It's going to take up that time, and Baruch Hashem, each lecture is at least a couple of hours, so that's at least a couple of hours you haven't sinned. But aside from that, as says the Chazonish, is that it's going to start training your ear, in so many words, training your brain, to start thinking kosher things. Start thinking the right things. This is the reason why even if a person did not learn the, the Shas Bavli, the Shas Yerushalmi, the Tosefta, the, the, uh, the, uh, the different Midrashim, the Alachot, whether it's the Rishonim, the Achronim, the Shulchan Aruch, anything else, but he just simply has been watching the lectures here for the last few years. Instantly, he sees results. And the more he listens, the more she listens to lectures, the more her life improves. The more she starts thinking clearly. The more he starts thinking clearly. He hasn't uprooted everything completely. They haven't completely become completely righteous, but they simply have improved themselves miles away from where they used to be just by listening to the Shura Torah. Because during that time, those two hours or four hours or eight hours that you're listening to Shure Torah, if they're good quality Shure Torah, then guess what? Number one, you're not sinning during that time. And number two, you are training your mind to accept the truth, to accept holiness, and to literally repel and become disgusted of anything that's opposite of it. So even if they haven't went to the core of all Kedusha into the depths of the Torah and toil in Torah for 10, 15 hours a day, still they've improved. And many times they've improved drastically. Why? Because they've turned their ears to the studies and knowledge. And this is a sure way of defeating the material craving and foreign attractions. Now, Rabbi Ephraim explains that we have two parts of our soul as we've already learned from this series. We have the spiritual soul and we have the physical one. And the biggest difference between the two is that if you feed the physical soul, the spiritual one remains hungry. You feed the spirit, the physical soul, you feed it some type of lust. You feed it some type of food. You feed it some type of moral, you know, issues of immorality. You feed it whatever it is that you want to feed your body. Your soul, as far as the spiritual aspect of you, is still hungry. Many times even hungrier. On the other hand, when you're learning Torah and you're feeding yourself spiritually, all of a sudden your physical self is satiated. You haven't fed yourself physically, but it becomes satiated. Your desires for physicality all of a sudden becomes happy, sustained, satiated. You're no longer looking for different things like you did before you listened to that Shio Torah. Unfortunately, it doesn't last. You have to keep listening. You have to keep learning because if you learn today for a couple of hours, it may help you for several hours or even the whole day today. But tomorrow is a whole new day. So if you think that today is going to hold you up for the whole week, you're sadly mistaken. Because tomorrow the Satan is coming back with a whole new realm of weapons. And he's going to start giving you new billboards and new commercials and new opportunities to steal and new opportunities to lie and new opportunities to say all types of gossip and new opportunities to do all types of horrible things that are damaging your soul, but he makes them look delicious. He makes you think, listen, if you wear this modest dress, who's going to look at you? No one's going to look at you. You're going to look like, uh, I don't know, some married woman, some grandmother, some, some horrible thing. Wear this provocative dress. Wear these high heels that are extremely uncomfortable but somehow make your body look like you're a fish. You know, wear this wig that's longer than the exile so everyone thinks you're like somewhat like resembling a horse running through the wind. Wear all of these things so everybody looks at you and says, hey, you look good today. 
That feels good, doesn't it? And she said, yeah, I guess, sure. And he starts making her think that, yeah, some strange man imagining her in all types of horrific ways is a good thing. In so many words, looking at her, no different than you look at a, at a garbage can that's public property. Anyone can look at it. If somebody went through your garbage, you would pretty much wouldn't care. The Yetzirah makes you think that you and the garbage can perhaps have something in common. Everyone can look at you also. Everyone can imagine you also. Everyone can open up also. Why not? He makes you think that's good. And in fact, he convinces you to be a fancy garbage can. How so? Entice him to look at you. Do things to make him look at. Don't just be the average, you know, green garbage can here in Cooper City. Have a, you know, be a garbage can that has heels. Be a garbage can that, uh, you know, has music. Be a garbage can that's really loud and obnoxious so everyone knows that you've appeared. You know, have one of these laughs that's like comes out of some cartoon. Ha, 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 ha. And what is so funny or scary? And where did that come from? Oh, it came from that woman that forgot her clothes at home. He convinces you that's good. And unfortunately, Rabutai, this is a day after you watch Shiur Torah. A day after you watch Shiur Torah, he convinces you that it's okay to have a boyfriend. Even though you heard in the Shiur Torah, having a boyfriend in Judaism is 100% forbidden. If you're not going to get married within the immediate future, you're not allowed to be alone. You're not allowed to be together in any shape or form. Yeah, but I love him. You won't love him once you burn for him. Yeah, but, but, uh, but he's a really nice guy. He's not going to be such a nice guy once you're burning for him. And guess what? You're not going to be such a nice girl once he burns for you. So what should I do? Do I really need to explain it? Rabotai Karim the Yetzara convinces you a day after you watch a Shiur Torah that this customer is so rich, who cares if you steal 100,000 from him? Yeah, but you just heard yesterday in a Shiur Torah that if you steal, you have to come back again into this whole life. But you're probably not going to come back as a person. You may come back as a horse. You may come back as a dog. You may come back as a cat. You may come back as a flower. Whatever way a Kadosh Baruch Hu decides in his divine wisdom that you can repay the debt back. And yesterday, you heard you're not allowed to steal. It helped you yesterday. You didn't steal yesterday when you heard the Shiur Torah. But that helped you for the day. What do you think the Yetzirah went out of business because you heard one Shiur Torah? No, he just took a day off. He said, oh, it didn't work today? Okay, we'll try again tomorrow. You didn't make any sales today? You're going to show up to work tomorrow. And you're probably going to work even harder. Guess what? The Yetzirah does the same. You didn't make any sales on you today because you listened to a Shiur Torah? Tomorrow he's coming back even stronger. He wants to keep up his number one salesman status. In so many words, when a person understands what he's dealing with here, he realizes what the Chazonish is trying to tell us. If you want to win this war against the Satan, the Malach HaMavit, and his wife, who is the expert in immorality, she is in charge. She's the queen bee in immorality. She's in charge of it. She even cheats on a satan, but that's a lecture for a different time. Literally, I'm not, this is not figuratively speaking. There's a whole commotion and schlumbite problems up there in, uh, in, in, in Gehenom over there between the two of them. She is in charge of immorality. Yesterday, you watched the Tikkun Abrit movie and you didn't do Pkama Brit. You didn't even want to look at your breed. You didn't touch your breed. You didn't want to look at it. In fact, you didn't even want to think that you have it. Why? You were so scared after you watched the Tikkun breed movie that you're like, whoa, I don't even need to watch the Gano movie. That's enough. But guess what? The next day, 
you're back to square one. The Satan's wife is back. She says, oh, you know what? Tonight, I'm going to send him even a prettier girl. And instead of him going up to her to say, hey, what's your name? Where you're from? She's going to come up to him. Hey, what's your name? Where you're from? No one's ever encountered him. No one's even looked at him. But tonight they will. Why? Because they work for the Satan's wife. Yeah, but I just learned to a uh, tikkun abrig yesterday, Rabbi. Yeah, you're right. Yesterday is a long time ago. Like my kids tell me. Abba, do you remember a long time ago yesterday? That's how it works, Rabbi. You watch a shiur Torah, it helps you. Yesterday. Today is a whole new day. Either put on a shiur Torah today, or you're simply subject to all types of risks. All types of horrors. Now, when a person feeds their neshama Torah, it helps him satiate the physical lusts. And in fact, the Chazoni says, it alleviates him from these foreign attractions. Why does he call these netiot azarot, these attractions that are foreign, why are they foreign? Because naturally, his soul wants good things. Her soul wants good things. The, a normal person doesn't want to eat poison. A normal person doesn't want to commit suicide. A normal person doesn't want to hurt anybody else. But yet, a normal person under the influence will do all of the above because he's no longer normal. He has removed himself. She has removed herself from normal by listening to the Yetzirah and not having the Torah to defend her. By listening to the Yetzirah and having no idea that he even has the tools to defend himself because that was a long time ago yesterday. So now they come with these new weapons, this new beauty queen from hell, this new opportunity to corrupt and steal, this new opportunity to destroy yourself, and that soul that naturally wants good things, naturally runs away from poison, all of a sudden says, maybe I should try a little bit. Wait, but, but it's poison. Yeah, but... You only live once. What do you mean you only live once? You're going to live once literally. You're going to die now. Yeah, but you don't know. It's a suffix. You may not die. Maybe they don't know. Maybe it's going to give you like some type of like high and you feel really good. A lot of people did it and they didn't die. And that's how drugs work. And that's how alcohol works. And that's how immorality works. Adultery works. No one thinks that their wife or husband is going to catch them cheating. They're not doing it because they want to hurt their husband or wife that they're cheating on. They want to do it because they're not going to know. And they want to fulfill their physical desires. Yeah, but when you said, I love you to your wife, in your wildest dreams, you didn't think that you were ever going to be in this situation where you would think that cheating on them, lying to them, betraying them with some filthy person that's giving themselves away like a garbage can, you never thought that that would be possible because you yourself decided to commit to this one person. You yourself decided that this is the only person you want to be with for the rest of your life. Naturally, you want the good things. So what happened? Simple. Whatever you felt then is a long time ago. The tools you had to make you feel that way are long gone, forgotten, as if they never existed. Because right now, without Torah, without whatever you had that convinced you to stay good, the bad takes over. These foreign attractions 
become appealing. The poison looks delicious. Says the Chazonish, for the corrections of one's character does not negate self-love. The existence of tendencies towards pleasure and honor is a positive component of the creature called man. Negating these tendencies does not build up man's soul, but rather destroys it. Here the Chazonish addresses the issue at hand that we started and we call this shiu, which is about self-love. Many times people think that if they are going to fix themselves by becoming more humble, that means they're going to hate themselves. And many times there's this misunderstanding from people where they think that the more humble you are, the more self-effacing you are, the more you insult yourself, the more you uh, torture yourself. Here the Chazoni says no. Self-love is a mitzvah. As it says, Ve'ahavta lerecha kamocha. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, meaning that you have to love yourself. It's a mitzvah. And in fact, it's not only a mitzvah, it's the way you were created. You were supposed to love yourself. But the difference is you have to know that you have to love yourself the right way. Because if you're going to express loving yourself by satiating every physical need you have, then in reality, you can say you love yourself as much as you want, but all you're doing is torturing yourself. Sort of like how a guy says to his wife he loves her while he cheats on her with five different women. Sort of like how a guy says to his customers, trust me, while he's running a Ponzi scheme. Sort of love how a company says, listen, we are looking for your best and we're designing the best cures for you while literally creating poison for society. They're saying one thing, but their actions are different. If a person says he loves himself and he's looking to fulfill his expression of love for himself or herself by fulfilling their physical needs then guess what? You are expressing hatred for yourself, not love. So wait. So on one end, being humble doesn't mean hating yourself. Loving yourself is a mitzvah, but giving yourself what you want and what you desire is bad. So how does this work? The Chazonish elaborates and says, Musar tells a person, love yourself and acquire honor and respect, but know where your true happiness in the world stems from and what your true source of honor is. True honor lies in Torah. True honor lies in humility. True honor lies in abandoning honor. True happiness lies in liberating yourself from natural tendencies and subjecting oneself to Hashem and to His Torah, the goal of life both in this world and the next. In so many words, says the Chazonish that yes, you are obligated to love yourself. You need to love yourself. But you also need to know how to love yourself. Loving yourself doesn't mean satiating all of your physical hungers. Loving yourself means satiating your spiritual hungers. Loving yourself means that you have to know what is good for you. And what's good is Torah. And going with what the Torah says. Because those those physical needs can sometimes be bad for you. But also sometimes be good for you. No one is telling you to become a Rav Steinemann overnight and eat some uh, oatmeal with some hot water for the next 80 years. No one is telling you to subjugate yourself to uh, some type of life where you're like one of the tzaddikim that's only together with his wife once a week. No one is telling you to do that. 
No one is telling you that you should let the whole world step on you on day one and pretend like you're Moshe Rabbeinu. No one is telling you to do that. No one is telling you to be something that you're not. But at the same token, no one is telling you to continue satisfying yourself with no end. So a person needs to know that loving yourself is a mitzvah. But it must be directed towards positive things. For example, if a person thinks that they're going to break their midah, they're going to break their midah of lust. They're just going to uproot them, their lust from themselves. Rabbi Nachman Mibreslev says, all you're going to do by breaking that midah of lust is have double. You broke it, but now you have double. Why? Because you're not supposed to break the midah and uproot the midah of, of, of lust. There's a part of it you need in order to fulfill the mitzvah of bringing children to the world, in order to fulfill the mitzvah of being together with your wife or husband, in order to fulfill the mitzvah of being human. Another person says, you know what? I'm going to break the midah of hunger, the midah of, of food. Well, guess what? What's going to end up happening is they're either going to be sick or you're going to end up hating Judaism. No one is telling you to do that. Oh, you know what? I'm going to be the most humble person in the world. And I'm going to let everybody just say whatever they want to say about me. And in fact, I'm even going to insult myself in public. I want to make a video of myself and tell everybody, listen, you really probably hate me. You probably don't want to listen to me. I'm probably clueless but anyway i don't have anything else to do so let me just tell you what i want to think that 10 15 seconds of self-effacing it's not healthy for you it's not healthy for your audience it's not good for anybody why nobody asked you to do that you're supposed to love yourself just know how to so how do you actually do this without going against the grain the Mitzvah of gava. Mitzvah of arrogance. Perhaps one of the most often spoken about topics, I think, in our lectures over the years when it comes to specific uh, uh, traits is arrogance. And generally speaking, we talk about how arrogance is toy it's, uh, it's an abomination. But in fact, even arrogance can be used in a positive way and Hashem wants you to use it. How? is a pasuk in the Torah that says, libo Hashem, that he was raised his heart proudly towards the ways of Hashem. Meaning that in your servitude of Hashem, you're as proud as can be. In your own things, or oh, you being a good speaker, you being rich, you having a beautiful wife, you having really uh, uh, smart kids, you having, I don't know, beautiful stuff, whatever it is, that no. That is no, arrogance does not belong there. Because everything Hashem gave you. Everything Hashem gave you. But to be proud of how you serve Hashem, the fact that you serve Hashem altogether, that's a mitzvah. Be proud of how you, how you serve Hashem. Be proud of the fact that you are serving Hashem. Proud so much that if anyone gets in the way and tells you, no, listen, you're fanatic. Exactly, Bo Hashem, thank you. Thank you for the compliment. I'm fanatic about Hashem. I love him so much. I don't think about anything other than him. Yeah, but you know, it's, some people are not like that. Well, exactly, I'm trying to help them. Give them refwa shlema. They're not, they're not in this delicious world of, of being proud of Hashem, proud of being his son, proud of being his daughter, proud of being an existence, a microcosm in his world. What are they going to tell you then? Nothing. Because they're going to realize that the refwa shlema belongs their way, not yours. Be proud of the way you serve Hashem. Pride when it comes to material things is wrong. It's disgusting. It's an abomination. It literally, no different than all types of filthy things that your mind can think of. But being proud in your servitude of Hashem, psh, nothing greater than that in the world.
That's Pinchas, Ben Elazar, Ben Aaron Cohen. On the other hand, you have food desire. Person has a food desire. Person has a food desire, says, you know, I'm going to break it. I'm going to make a vow to never drink Coca-Cola again. I'm going to make a vow to never eat meat again. I'm going to take a, do a diet and I'm only going to eat plants every day. Who told you to do that? No, it's going to make me more righteous. No. No, it's probably going to make you more hungry. Most likely you're going to uh, eat more worms because, you know, generally speaking, there's more worms in salads than there is in, uh, in meat. Not to say that you shouldn't eat meat and only eat salad or not eat salad, but the point being is, is that just eating salad is not necessarily going to be a solution to make you righteous or happy or skinny because even a cow eats salad and it's really fat. The point being is, no one asked you to do these silly things that people do. Oh, I'm never going to eat this. Who asked you to do that? Who asked you, who asked you to, to do these things? Who asked you to do this? Where, which book says that you should make a vow to never eat steak again or never, eat, never drink coffee again or Coca-Cola again or, or never eat something? Who asked you to do this? No one. Why? Because it's, it's not the way of Torah. It's not the way of Torah. But at the other hand, no one told you eat it non-stop like, a, like some type of animal. No one told you drink 87 cups of coffee a day, eat meat five, seven times a week, and uh, if a chicken walks around you, just look at her and just pretty much cook her or eat her alive. No one says these things. So a person needs to understand that every physical desire has a place and a time. And in fact, there is a mitzvah to eat a lot. On Shabbat. On Shabbat, eat. Eat. Enjoy. Why? On Shabbat. Don't eat because you're, you're, you're a person that can't, you know, can't control themselves. Eat because it's a mitzvah to eat on Shabbat. You're fortunate enough to have good food. You're fortunate enough to have food. You're fortunate enough to celebrate Shabbat. Ishtabach shimo la'ad. You have food and you have Shabbat. You have everything. Go eat. Diet is not for today. Oh no, I'm not eating uh, bread. Why not? I'm on a diet. Diet is for six days a week, not for Shabbat. Diet somewhere else. This is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. If your diet, your personal preference, your ideas interfere with mitzvot, automatically you turn them into something cursed. If you're not eating at a seudat mitzvah, at a meal of a mitzvah, if you're not eating like you're supposed to be eating in pleasurable eating as part of Onik Shabbat, guess what? Whatever you're doing is cursed because it's not the way of Torah. It's not the way of Torah. No one is telling you to eat a, a whole cow every day. No one is telling you to eat candy until you uh, bleed uh, sugar. No one says that. But at the same token, don't start making decisions that, oh, yeah, I'm going to become more righteous by limiting my uh, physical uh, uh, consumption. And Whoa. There's a time and a place. There's a time and a place. On Shabbat, on holidays, eat. Rosh Chodesh, eat. Enjoy. It's a mitzvah to enjoy. In fact, it's a mitzvah to eat a little bit of every single thing that your wife or your husband is preparing. Mitzvah. So here you see that if a person understands that, yes, a food desire, a food desire, if it's for the sake of my physical fitness, if it's for the sake of what people think of me, if it's for the sake for anything physical and not for the sake of Hashem, there's something wrong with it. But if it's for the sake of Hashem, it doesn't make a difference what anybody thinks. Why? If it's for the sake of Hashem, it must be right. It must be right. Rav Moshe Feinstein, Allah Shalom, was in a hospital and... He was in a very, very difficult situation. They were very scared to give him anything because there was tubes down his throat 
And they were afraid that if you give him anything, any liquid, he could choke and die. Rav Moshe Feinstein was struggling physically, but spiritually he was at his best. How do we know? Because when one of his Talmidim saw the situation and saw how Rav Moshe Feinstein's mouth was getting really dry, he asked the doctors, can I give him a little bit of water? He said, I'm sorry, we can't, it's a life risk. To give him water right now, it's a life risk. He could choke and die. So, yeah, but look at his mouth, it's so dry. I mean, it's, it's, it must be painful. We're sorry, we rather, it, there's nothing we could do. He said, the best, only thing you could do is you can give him candy. Give him a lollipop. Okay, quickly, ran, got a kosher lollipop. Came to the Rav, said, Rav, Kvodarav, look, look, I got you a lollipop to at least moisten your, your, your mouth a little bit. Moshe Feinstein looked at the lollipop, thought about it for a second, smiled. Ah, yes, yes, I'm going to keep that for Shabbat. What? The mouth is chipping away already, it's so, it's so dry. He hasn't drunk, he hasn't eaten, he hasn't anything. The candy, soften up the mouth, do something, taste something. Yes, we can, it's good. Shabbat. Why? That's when I fulfill that mitzvah. I don't eat to fulfill the mitzvah of eating. I eat to fulfill the mitzvah of Shabbat. I eat to fulfill the mitzvah of saying Birkat Amazon. I eat to fulfill the mitzvah of saying a blessing before. That everything is connected to a mitzvah. And for him, there's no greater mitzvah than, than enjoying some food on Shabbat. So here we see Rabotai Karim that while a person may want to imagine themselves becoming a Rav Steinemann and some of the other tzaddikim that literally live on very little, they first have to know you're not them. And they weren't always themselves. Rav Kaduli, I love a shalom, used to eat bamba for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But that wasn't Rav Kaduli his whole life. Rav Steinemann that ate little bread pieces in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in hot water, that wasn't his whole life. All of the great sages that you hear stories about them, of how they're, you know, they sustained their body with very little, it, was, it wasn't always that case. They built themselves up for there. But that was only after they've perfected everything they could perfect, and then they're going to the next chapter. A person says, you know what? Fine. I understand that you have to be pure. The rabbi always says, what it says in Parashat Kedoshim, Kedoshim Tiyu Ki Kadoshani, be holy because I am holy. That's what Hashem says to us. And the Ramban says over there, be holy not only in the things that are permitted to you, but also the things that are not permitted, that are um, not only be holy in the things that are not permitted to you, but even be holy on the things that are permitted to you, meaning the issues of morality. So a person says, you know what? I'm going to become a uh, celibate. I'm not going to touch anybody. Who told you to do that? What are we, monks? What are we, the Pope? The I chief idol worshiper? No one told you to never touch anybody. Never. No one told you that. You just have to know that there's a time and a place to fulfill that desire, to fulfill that mitzvah. And we have a whole series on that particular topic called Jewish intimacy. If you follow what the Ramban says completely, and not just that commentary, but the whole thing of what he says, when he writes in his Igeret HaKodesh about Jewish intimacy, then you'll know that Jewish intimacy is not only allowed, not only something that's good, but it actually can elevate your Avodat Hashem to the highest possible level, even more than learning Torah. Even more than learning Torah. When we learn that in that series, literally, I think I saw a few people's minds blow up through the internet. So 
Yes, physical intimacy can turn you into a literally a beast. But no one told you to stop. Just channel that desire in the right place. Simple. Do it the right way with your spouse at appropriate times with appropriate things in your mind. And that's one of the things that people have to understand. Judaism is not looking to torture you. The Torah is not here to turn you into some weird creature that lives on air. HaKadosh Baruch Hu made these mitzvot whether it's procreation for the sake of the marriage, procreation for the sake of uh, bringing children to the world, eating for the sake of a mitzvah, saying blessings before you eat, saying blessings after you eat, uh, you know, giving charity, uh, accepting charity, you know, all of these things, that's because this is what you are, you're a human being. And loving yourself is by following what you were created to do, not what you're enticed to do. And there lies the difference. A person has to understand that although the media, the street, the ignoramuses of the world will tell you, come on, do it, get some respect, respect yourself. Torah says, true respect of self, true honor, lies in humility. The more humble you are, the more you're respecting yourself. Because you're literally putting yourself exactly where you need to be. The more honor, the more you abandon honor. Not looking for respect. Not looking for recognition. Not looking for every little charity you ever made to be posted on some type of billboard in a synagogue uh, hallway. No. You know that God knows what you did. That's already enough. The community doesn't necessarily need to know unless it's going to encourage them to do it too. But generally speaking, more times than not, it's not. You don't need to publicize all of your good deeds to the world. Unless you're trying to motivate people. But more times than not, people are not looking to motivate people. They're looking for honor. They're looking for credit. They're looking for respect. So the Yetzirah is going to tell you, yeah, get your respect. The Yetzirah's wife is going to say, you deserve respect. HaKadosh Baruch says, real respect of self is being humble. Real respect of self, real honor is being humble. On the other hand, a person says, yeah, but I want freedoms. I want to do whatever I want. I want to be happy. And the only way I'm going to be happy is by being free. Free of the obligations. Wrong. Freeing yourself from a Torah does not give you freedom, but rather turns you into a slave. A slave to your physical desires. A slave to people's perception. A slave to people's opinions. A slave to everything but God. Because now that a person abandons God, chas v'shalom, he has, doesn't have Torah that's going to direct him of where and he needs to go where he should go. So he goes with the flow, as they say. So the flow tells him, listen, you're free. So you can be with whoever you want. And he does. And then he realizes that the more free he is, the more miserable he is. Aside from being more prone to disease, he's also more prone to a lot of other problems, whether it be drugs or other forms of immorality, And most critically, he's more prone to depression. Yeah, but he has 15 girlfriends. And he always feels alone. Yeah, but she has five boyfriends. And she always feels like a tool. Like a garbage bag. That's how she feels. Even though she has five boyfriends. And all of them buy her presents. She feels like a garbage bag. 
containing everybody's waste. Freeing yourself from the rules of the Torah didn't turn you into somebody free. It turned you into a garbage bag. It turned you into a slave. And if you're not going to talk about the immorality aspects of freedom from the Torah, they say go into the materialism aspect of it. Oh, I'm free. I don't have to fulfill the mitzvot so I could, you know, do whatever I want. Yeah, doing whatever you want, that means that you work on Shabbat. I take a vacation on Shabbat. Who's free? You work on Shabbat, I'm on vacation. Which one of us is free? You work on holidays, I take off holidays. Which one of us is free? Yeah, but I get a vacation. I also get a vacation. In fact, I get more vacation than you do. No, no, but I can take a vacation even when it's not Jewish holidays. I can too. Just because it's not a Jewish holiday doesn't mean I'm, uh, I'm obligated to work. I can take a vacation whenever I can, whenever I feel like it. Meaning that what you think you can do as a person that's empty of Torah and Torah lifestyle is not really freedom. Because whatever you do, most of it, the religious people can do also. Only difference is, you'll go to Gehenom for it, we're going to heaven for it. That's what Arab Nisimi again used to tell people all the time. You and I do the same things. Only difference is you're going to Ganom for it. I'm going to Gan Eden for it. Why? You did it in the ways that are against the Torah. I did it in the ways that the Torah permits. You wanted to fulfill your lust. I wanted to fulfill my lust. You did it in a non-kosher way with some woman that's not your wife when she's Nida. You're going to Ganom for a very long time. Oh Hashem, his wife. And the kids don't come from the air. They don't just appear. Some bird drops them off like in the cartoons. And guess what? I get to enjoy the kids too. I get to enjoy seeing them grow up. I get, enjoy, I get to enjoy too seeing them learn. Call me Abba. What do you get to enjoy? Nothing. You get to enjoy like, oh wow, she's pregnant? Oh yeah, is she going to have an abortion? So we commit murder together? What do you get to enjoy? Nothing. Eat. You eat, we eat. You eat food that's not kosher. We eat food that's kosher. You're going to Ganom, we're going to Gan Eden. What benefit do you get? What, your food's more delicious? How do you know? Did you try the kosher food? Oh, I didn't like it. You tried all the kosher food in the world, you didn't like any of it? Do you know that you can make that non-kosher food kosher also most of the time? Yeah, but I like bacon. So you can make turkey bacon kosher. Yeah, but I like shellfish. You can make soy uh, shellfish. It's not really shellfish, it's soy. Everything you really want, you can get in a kosher way. It's just that the yetzara in you convinced you that you want to be free by turning you into a slave. Free by turning you into a slave. Not, fr not free, really. There is no freedom without Torah. And that's what people simply do not understand until they try seriously to follow the Torah and achieve real freedom. The same goes when it comes to Avodat Amidot, fixing our Midot. While the Yetzirah is going to convince you, listen, I'm just expressing myself. So what if I'm allowed? So what if I'm angry? So what if this? So what if I... I'm arrogant. No, you're not understanding. The arrogance, the anger, is hurting you. It's not hurting the other people only. It's hurting you more than everybody else. The Gemara says that an arrogant person is even hated by his own family. So, yeah, you can continue being free and being arrogant, but your wife will cheat on you, your husband will cheat on you, your kids will hate you. As soon as they grow up, they'll get married and run away from you. And if you have money, they'll stick to you only because you have money and looking forward for the day you die. No one is going to want to be part of your life. They're only going to use you as a tool, like a hammer. So, yeah, you're free to be, you know, to be this angry, arrogant monster, but you're just turning yourself into a hammer. Is that really freedom? 
by being humble, by being having some self-control. My wife loves me. The husband loves her. The kids love them. They can't wait to come over for Shabbat even after they've grown up and they have a wife and kids and a husband and kids of their own. They want to come over. They want to be next to you. Why? Because you're nice to be around. They're not looking forward to the day you die. In fact, they pray for you to live. You have a little bit of pain, they start reading Tehilim for you. Yeah, but it's just, uh, it's just my foot hurts. Yeah, but Bezat Hashem, you have refuah shlema, and you see these kids start crying, Ribono Olam, Abba has a foot ache, please Hashem, bring the salvation, literally as if you have cancer of the fifth degree. Why? Because they love you. But when you're an arrogant person, no one loves you. Everyone runs away from you. So is that freedom really? What freedom is that? I want to be free and eat whatever I want. Eat. Is that really freedom? That you can eat cockroaches of the sea and of the land? That's what you're celebrating? That you're eating some, uh, some type of crocodile or an octopus? That's your freedom? That's the uh, existence that you have in this world? That you're eating little creatures that eat dirt? That is freedom for you. Just go into the jungle, walk around like them, act like them, and perhaps you may have more people to relate to. How is that freedom? The reality is, Rabotai, that the more a person understands the Torah, the more they see that there is no freedom other than Torah. It's a statement that's mentioned constantly by the sages, not because it's simply true, but rather because it is reality. It is reality. It is, it is the only truth that exists. There is no other truth. Everything else is a lie that the Satan has convinced us through his messengers, through his wife, through his workers. He's convinced us that freedom means running away from a Torah. Freedom means not working on ourselves and fixing ourselves. Freedom means believing in things that are opposite of a Torah. Freedom means never getting punished. Freedom means God loving us no matter what. Freedom is this and freedom is that, but in reality, all of these things are simply chains. Chains around our arms and legs, chains around our souls, chains around ourselves that are worse than the worst jail you can possibly imagine. When a person understands that all of the negative traits that have turned them into a low life are not expressions of freedom, are not expressions of loving themselves, but rather the opposite, then they can finally understand what our sages are saying, what the Chazonish is saying here. It's like, yes, you have to love yourself, but you also have to know how to express that love. And loving yourself means following a set of instructions from the Creator that created you, that created the instructions that created love itself and knows exactly how you can achieve it. If you follow it, you're guaranteed to love yourself and enjoy that love. Literally feel the joy of loving yourself because all of a sudden, you're no longer a slave to desires. You're no longer a slave to people's opinions. You're no longer a slave to anyone except HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which you're happily doing. And that, Rabotai, gives you a new desire, a desire to be proud. It gives you pride, but the right pride, the pride to go in the ways of Hashem. 
This Rabotai is one of the fundamentals that a person must know in the back of their mind, in the front of their mind, every single day. Because if you're watching this lecture already for the last hour plus, certainly you're here to learn something. You're here to learn how to better yourself. You'd be ashamed that if you just watch these lectures like it's background music on an elevator and don't do something. If you're not going to change different flaws that you know very well are flaws, how are you going to achieve your purpose? How are you ever going to be happy? How are you ever going to be free? Now many times there are different messengers of the Satan that are going to convince you that there's a better way. But yet, they themselves haven't achieved it. They themselves are not happy. Why listen to people that are unhappy about how to be happy? It's like getting advice about financial matters from someone homeless. It simply doesn't make any sense. Listen to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Listen to His sages. The ones that lived the Torah. The ones that lived the mitzvot. The ones that attained all of the greatest feelings you can possibly imagine. Don't try shortcuts. There is no shortcut. You want to be happy? You have to follow the Torah. You want to be successful? You have to be follow the Torah. You want to go to Olam Abba and be in a good place forever? You have to follow the Torah. Everything that causes you to stay away from the Torah, to get away from the Torah, to take a break from the Torah, is not good. It's a trap. It's not going to give you freedom. It's not going to give you good. It's not going to give you anything that you would actually want once you get it. And sometimes, people think, that they can get away with murder. They can get away with all types of things. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu has patience. But eventually, he shows people that he's boss. We'll finish off with a story. A story of a person that thought that he can do whatever he wants and still pretend to be relig religious. A couple of hundred years ago, there was a sofer that wrote tefillin, wrote sifre Torah, wrote mezuzot. It was relatively well known. One day, the sofer decided to rape his daughter-in-law, his wife's wife, his uh, son's wife. Now, he was apparently so established and so arrogant that he didn't think much of it that people knew. Two witnesses who saw it came to the Gdolado, the Noda Beyuda, Rabbi Yecheskel Landau. And Rabbi Yecheskel Landau heard this with his two witnesses that witness this horrific thing take place. He invited him to the Beddin. And he says to him, Rasha, admit it. Admit what you did. The wicked Sofer said, admit what? I didn't do anything. It's not like today where Every step you take, there's 15 cameras pointing at you, whether it's people's phones or it's all types of cameras in the world of security and satellites. Back then, no cameras, no nothing. We're talking about 200, 250 years ago. So he thought, it's my word against theirs. They said I did it. I say they're liars. The Nudabi Yudan said to him, You're a sofer. Write me some verses from the Torah. 
I want to see your writing. He gives him a cluff, parchment, and he starts writing different verses of the Then the W. Da says to him, Write me the verse that says, Ervat kalatecha lo tegale. The nakedness of your kala, your daughter in law, you're not going to see. It's a verse in the Torah. And this Rasha, like all the other verses, he gets ready to write this verse and uh, 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 his hand won't move. And he tries again, uh, uh, it won't move. He says, What's going on with the pen? The day, he can't do anything. At that moment, the Nodabi Yuda knew for sure that from Shemaim, this is the third witness. Not just the two witnesses that came to the Beddin, but Akadosh Baruch Hu himself is a witness in this case. But this horrific Sofer is denying it. Meaning that his low life status is at such a high level that even if the Nodabi Yuda has a Lachic precedence to prove that he's guilty, it's not going to stop him from doing what he's doing. In fact, even if he tells everybody, listen, this Sofer is a Rasha. He raped his daughter-in-law. All this Sofer is going to do is pick up his stuff, go to another city, and start brand new, and write people to fill in, and write people mezuzot, and write Sifret Torah, all of which are not kosher anymore. Why? Because he's a mumal. The halacha is if somebody like this, a mumar, is not allowed to you to, uh, to do such a thing. Not allowed to. If he writes tefillin, tefillin not kosher. He writes a sefer Torah, to, sefer Torah is not kosher. The Nudabi Yudah, Rabbi Yecheske, Landau knew that this lowliness is not going to be fixed by the reality of Musal. But as he saw this person not capable of writing the verse, Time and time again, he cannot write this verse. He took the instructions from heaven into his own hands, grabbed an axe, and immediately chopped off a couple of his fingers. So that way, he's never going to be able to write again and cause other people to sin with his non-kosher tefillin and his non-kosher sifra Torah and his non-kosher mezuzot in his non-kosher existence because he's not even willing to do tshuva. Now, of course, today we can't do things like this. We don't have the beddins of yesteryear. We don't have the power of the beddins of yesteryear. But the point being is, is that what we learned in the beginning of this shiur, as the Chazoni says, is that there are some people that are such low lives even Musar is not going to help them because, simply put, the root is rotten and the only way to get them out of it is if they start learning Torah. But if a person denies himself that Torah, there's no helping him altogether. Now each and every single person that's watching this certainly has some Torah, some Musar, and certainly is not in a status of complete lowliness. But that doesn't mean that the Yetzirah is not going to try to convince you to become one. And that's why more Shure Torah are needed, more Kiruv is needed, more learning is needed, more Musar is needed, more Torah is needed. What you did yesterday was a long time ago. What you did today is good for today. Tomorrow is a new day. Tomorrow, you'll need more. And the next day, more again. And while that seems like a big obligation, the reality is, is that this is feeding your soul what it needs to feel love from yourself. Thank you very much for learning with me. May Hashem continue to bless each and every single one of us to truly attain the right love of self to such a point where we literally can't wait to wake up in ourselves, wake up in the morning, 
and say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, thank you HaKadosh Baruch Hu, for having a munah in me and bringing me back to this world because that way I can not only love you again, I can love myself. We'll learn again later this week. Thank you.